Welcome to the last great day. It sure has been a wonderful week. Hate to see it go by so quickly, but we feel that way every year. Okay, if you'll stand and open your hymnals, let's start off today with page number 24. Oh God, we have heard. That's page number 24. Okay, now let's turn to page number 71. And we'll do Blessed Be the Tide, page 71. Afterwards, Mr. Roger Lawrence will open us in prayer, please. Page 71. Father, we know you see from your th throne, Father, how grateful we really are. We've been so blessed with your Holy Spirit. We're so thankful for your feast, Father. We had such good fellowship. We look forward to that day when thy kingdom comes. And now, Father, in this last great day, we wait for your arrival. We ask that you bless this holy convocation today and inspire the speakers and the listeners that we continue to follow your way, Father, until thy kingdom come. And we pray in the precious and holy name, the one who is God who can save, our Lord in Christ, who is who's called Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Roger. On the prayer list, we still want to remember Mary Jane Bird. I hope she's doing better. Um, Aiden Branch. Um, Bridget Brown 
Is Sonny Phillips, is that his name? Oh, oh no, that was the uh, grandmother. Oh, okay, all right. And of course, Annie and Dale Ann, still on the list. Um, Fern and Pete, still praying for you. Uh, Roger's dad, you're still on the list. Yep, and Christina's husband's knee is getting better, is that right? That's wonderful, yeah. Give thanks to God for that, for sure. Uh, Charles Manley, he's still in the hospital. I'm hearing, so we want to make sure we give extra prayer out for, for him and his family. Um, is this Rosie? I don't know what that says under here, but under that's Phil Dorsey. He's still on the list, is that correct? Yeah. And then uh, Merritt Brant Bowman, right? Merritt Bowman, suffering from cancer. So we want to remember all these people and keep them on the list. So, also, um, we're going to have blessing of the children this morning. If anyone wants to have their, their child come up, and the ministers will do blessing on the children, if you'd like that, please, at this time. so much for this Feast of Tabernacles. We thank you for the promise of life. We thank you for these beautiful children here. We come before you at this time and we pray for Matthew that you would that you would bless him and protect him in his life, that you help him to, to grow up strong and just and true, that you put your angels about him everywhere that he goes and in everything that he does. It can be a vicious world out there. We know that you are our protector and our sustainer and our provider. We thank you for that. We thank you for hearing our prayers. We thank you for your hand in his life. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Father in heaven, we're praying over Joseph uh, Anderson, and we ask for your protection with him. He's, he's with a family that follows your ways, Father, and he's, he's taught your ways and your, your might and your praise, Father. We pray that you continue to protect him. It's an awful world out there. He needs protections from your angels. So we ask for your blessing on this little, little man, and uh, in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Okay, let me go back. Our Heavenly Father, most holy and righteous, loving Creator God, we come before you with another request that you bless this little child, that you bless Anna, that you protect her, that you guide her in the ways in which she should go, the straight way and not the way of the world. And we ask these things and pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, and always give you thanks. Amen. 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 <laughs> Most gracious Father, we, we ask you to be with little James. Bless him, protect him, guide him, lead him on his whole life, dear Heavenly Father. Give him joy and success and Lord, continue to be with his parents, Lord, as we see their hand in his life. Thank you so much. Be with him always. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Very good. And we got the big guy. Yeah. <laughs> He's next. I'm next. Yeah. 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 <laughs> they need extra protection. Yeah. Very yeah. yeah. dear my Father, we come to you once again. Listen to this child, Father. We pray that you go with him and as he grows, that he can go strong in the truth and understanding of your word. For we ask that your son, Jesus Christ, holy, 
Lord, we ask you to pray for Jane. Amen. 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 Father, thank you again for this this man we are here. Ask you to bless him down him, that you protect him, of teaching your ways, Father, and, and protect him throughout his life, that he grow in grace and knowledge as you ask us to do. We ask you to protect him, to guide him, and to be with him throughout the rest of his life, Father. In Jesus Christ's name, we ask these things, knowing that you will provide. Amen. 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 Thank you, Minister. That's a beautiful thing, isn't it? Yes. Nothing like wonderful children. Sure is a blessing. Okay. I think it's time for the first speaker today, and that will be Mr. Michael Armstrong, please. Good morning, everybody. Here we are, right? Poof, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, to borrow a phrase, it's over. Feast is gone. We're here at the last great day. Goes by so quick. You know, it takes a lot to it takes a lot to make this happen, doesn't it? it takes a lot from from each and every one of you. You know, to be here, to participate, to 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 make all the activities and everything a success. It's awesome. It's such a great time to to be here and to be able to do that. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody, really. Because everybody that participates, that uh, makes it a feast. Yeah, we'll clap for everybody. Pat on the back. Pat yourselves on the back. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely want to thank Chris and April, though, and, and David and Kay, and everything that they do, all the work that goes on behind the scenes. Uh, it's work. You know, they're getting an idea of what it's going to be like in the kingdom, serving. You know, I don't know about you, but I didn't take out any of the bathroom trash this week, did you? <laughs> I saw Chris had it in there, though. <laughs> and very thankful, very thankful that they're willing to, to step up and take on that role because it's a lot of responsibility and it's certainly a blessing to have those who are, who are willing and able. <laughs> yeah, for Chris. Yeah. For the whole plan there. Yeah, good, very good. I'd like to focus on some positive things today. You know, we're, we're picturing a different period today, a different period of time. The last great day, you know, the, the offering of salvation, the, the knowledge of the truth to all of those who have gone without it through life. A chance, a chance at the truth, at what we know, at the blessings of righteousness. It's an enormous thing. It's an, it's an enormous and a wonderful thing. And uh, you know, if you wonder if the intermediate period uh, will, will feel like it goes by as quickly as this feast does. You wonder, you wonder if that period of time, the thousand years with Jesus Christ under his personal supervision and leadership, uh, going to be amazing, obviously going to be a great, going to be a great, great time. But you wonder if it's going to go by as quick as this goes by. If you look back and you think, where did, the, where, did, where did it all go? I feel like I just got here, and now it's time for something different. You know, now it's time for the next phase. I'd like to read Psalm 149, which I think is something I referenced or mentioned the last time I was up here, but did not actually read. Psalm 149, right at the back of the Psalms, starting in verse 1. Praise ye the Lord. Sing unto the Lord a new song in His praise in the congregation of the saints. Let Israel rejoice in Him that made Him. Let the children of Zion be joyful in their King. Let them praise His name in the dance. Let them sing praises unto Him with the timbrel and harp. For the Lord takes pleasure in His people. He will beautify the meek with salvation. Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud upon their beds. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand. And that sword is going to be for the establishing of justice, of course, as I, I focused on last time. And it will be a wonderful and a joyous thing to have the truth and to have righteousness, to have the law established and the blessings that that comes. Uh, many of the sermons this year have spelled out exactly what it means to establish justice, specifically what God is looking for. And I'm thankful for that. Uh, God's Holy Spirit, it gives us what we need when we need it. And this is not a group, you know, when going into the, going into the millennium with Jesus Christ, whatever comes between now and then, not going to be great, obviously, but going into it, this is not a group. I don't have any doubt that... Uh, <laughs> 
you guys don't know what needs to happen when Christ returns. You know, is it, is it confusing? Is it unclear in any way? I feel like we've done a very good job of, of laying that out there. Specifically, what needs to change with the world? What can make it better? What can make it joyous and happy and free and safe for everyone? And that will be a great blessing. And this group really excels at that. I'm appreciative for those message and, and messages. Sometimes they're strong. Sometimes they're corrective. But what does the world need if not strong correction? Without it, where are we headed? Uh, that's not a positive thing to focus on. That's not what I want to focus on right now. We can rejoice in the truth. We can rejoice in the knowledge of what needs to happen. And we can rejoice in the fact that it is 100% going to be better. That someday it is going to be perfect. Sitting around talking today, uh, 2 Timothy 2.15 was mentioned uh, a couple times. Just in, our, just in our conversations, I thought that was funny because I already had it in my notes for this sermon. Uh, you don't have to turn there. Briefly, it says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We dig deep at times. We talk about prophecy, and we talk about the kingdom. We talk about the return of Christ. All these, all these things, in deep subjects, you know, how to, how to apply the law in today's, in today's society. Uh, these things that are, that are kind of heavy. But the world is really in need of basics, really basic stuff, really basic truths, you know, some do not steal, do not lie kind of stuff, and to have that established and to have it appreciated because, you know, it's not just... You, you don't want to be... They have to want it. You've got to make them want it. You have to make them appreciate that, that they need it and that it will be better that way, just as, just as you raise children and have to teach them that. And like I said, I feel like this group knows that, that they know those things, those basics, and that the, that the world needs and that you will be able to apply. Someday you will be able to apply that all around you. <laughs> I would vote for just about any one of you, <laughs> right? Uh, because I, I think that you know good from evil. I, I think that you know right from wrong. And most importantly, I think you know how to rely on God at all times. Because it's His will, uh, it's, the force of, it's the force of His Holy Spirit that will bring all of these plans to fruition. You know, He's taken us from lives of sin uh, with a very strong hand, often. Just as He took Israel out of Egypt with a very strong hand. And He did it for His own name's sake. Not because they were righteous, not because we were righteous, for his own name's sake, to accomplish his will, to accomplish his plan. And at some point in time, he is going to forcibly take the entire world and show them the path of life, to lay it out clearly before them when there is no more room for excuse or confusion or anything like that, to have it plain and clear and true and to be able to make that choice. That choice that you've all made, that path that you're walking on right now. Everybody's going to have that opportunity. It's an enormous thing. Because I don't know about, about, about all of you, uh, but I did not just wake up one morning and decide, uh, I think I'll start living righteously. You know, I think I'll just do really good from now on. Uh, that's, not, that's not the way that it happened. And I doubt that's the way that it happened in your life either. Uh, because all of my stupid ideas, all my haughtiness and vanity and arrogance, uh, it didn't bring me anything but a whole bunch of trouble and suffering and problems. And I probably suffered most of all, but those that loved me suffered along with me to watch me be an idiot and make bad choices when I should have known better. You probably all feel that way about uh, your lives as well. Because it wasn't until uh, all of that was broken, until I was busted up and it had gone real wrong, and you know, you have some lessons that you heard along the way, things that my dad said, things that I heard other people that loved me, that, that knew right from wrong, had some of that stuff ringing in my ears before, before I was able to, <laughs> to, to turn to what was right, before I realized I needed it. You know, you're broken first, often, before you're able to make that step, you're broken. All the arrogance, all the whatever you think you know, uh, it's done. Luke 20:18 says, Whoever shall fall upon that stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him into powder. There's a reference to Psalm 118 there, the, the stone that the builders rejected. There's a, there's a reference to Daniel, the second chapter, you know, Nebuchadnezzar's vision, the stone that is Christ returning to crush the kingdoms of the earth and, and to establish righteousness in its place. You know, it, it took finally being humbled enough to pray, to reach out to God. 
for me. That's what it took in my life. Maybe it, maybe it was the same for you, maybe it was different. But it was interesting, Roger mentioned when my, when my grandfather passed away that that, uh, that was a wake-up call. It was kind of a wake-up call for him. Uh, in my own life, it was, it was, I, I kind of had a moment similar, but not the same, or, but around the same thing. I was only 16 years old. I also didn't really contemplate the idea that he would pass away in that moment. I, you know, obviously the, the family was concerned and we would go to the hospital and pray about it at 16 years old, the time in my life where I wasn't really praying all that much. You know, I prayed for my grandfather and when those prayers were not answered and everybody's prayers on his behalf were not answered, I was pretty shocked. I, I was pretty surprised that it turned out that way and maybe, maybe a smidgen bitter. I don't know. I don't remember praying much after that point in time. Uh, but also afterwards, you know, there was a whole lot of foolishness, a whole lot of people that I had known and that were, that were around him, that were in his inner circle when he was traveling and building churches and, and doing the work. And, you know, here, here they are going about these things, supposed to be your examples, and then it turns into backbiting, it turns into squabbling and, and all these problems all of a sudden uh, to, to grasp and divide. And maybe some of you live through that, maybe not. You know, there's no reason to, to air dirty laundry. But in my, in my personal experience, that was really off-putting because it looked like a bunch of nonsense and hypocrisy. And that's what it made me think about it, disappointment in, in the, what had happened and then disappointment in what was happening. And uh, most of you are probably familiar with my dad and his updates and everything like that. And I want you to know that he's exactly that guy. <laughs> he's exactly that guy all the time. He's not some different guy the rest of the time. So you can, you can bet your life that I 100% knew what he thought about everything that was going on entirely through the way. And he did not spare. <laughs> Just as he does not, when he, when he speaks about what, was, what goes on in the world, he did not spare. Uh, Mr. Stan Roberts told me one time, he said, I've known him for a long time, and he's always been the same guy. And I, I took that as a big compliment, because a lot of people, you know, they're going to soft soap you or try to make you think they're something that they're not, or tell you what you want to hear. And I'm thankful that my dad didn't, didn't do that, because he didn't do that with me either. If he thought I was messing up, he told me. And I might not have liked it at the time, uh, but eventually, I had to acknowledge it. I had to consider whether or not it was the truth. And I had to, you know, you, know you, you grow up in the church, whatever, you see hypocrisy, you dismiss it, you go your own way, uh, and then you, you suffer for it. At least that was my experience, uh, to the point where when I finally did realize I needed something, when I didn't, couldn't trust the people that were around me, and you realize the people that you work with are scheming and lying and all this stuff, and that you're an exaggerator and you're not really any good either, uh, and that it's, it's all just garbage. I uh, finally had to pray, and it had gone so far, I had to pray. I, I remember where I was, actually. Uh, when you turn to God, you maybe you remember where you were as well. Somebody, somebody had that in a sermon, moments that you remember in your life. Uh, I remember I prayed, God, if you're, if you're real, if it's real, please help me understand, like I really want to know. And that was the beginning. It took a long time from then to come around and to, to learn and to grow and dating my wife at the time and you realize there are things that matter that things that you care about and, and that you want goodness and you want happiness and you want peace and you want to be able to trust the people that are around you uh, and there's no other way but it's here there it is there's no other way it's the only way and uh, you can you can try to find those things somewhere else and you won't there's there's the only way it's right here I've had to find that out the hard way. Being an Armstrong didn't help. Growing up in the church didn't help. You're going to learn it the hard way. Uh, and God willing, you don't have to learn it too hard. You know, if you have gotten good lessons and good teachers and, and good instruction, you know, maybe it doesn't have to be that hard. I, I didn't have to make all those mistakes, but in my arrogance, I did and paid for them. And, you know, I'm thankful for it in a way because I'm here now. And I'm thankful that God didn't give up on me, I suppose, through that. Uh, and I, hope, I pray that for my children and all these children up here that were blessed because it's a hard road and it's a hard world out there and there's a lot of stuff that's going to try to drag you down and pull you in the wrong way. But God will prevail. He can, will prevail over that. He can prevail in your life. Uh, and it's an amazing and it's a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful plan that He has. And most of the world has not had that opportunity. They haven't had, they didn't have the kind of instruction that I got growing up. Uh, doesn't, doesn't know the truth. Has not had the opportunity for that to, to even, to even know that they can cry out to God in trouble and to ask for understanding, to pray for wisdom as Solomon did, to just please show me 
a piece. Let me know if it's true. I think that's a prayer that is answered without fail, really. That's my personal belief. Maybe I'm extrapolating or going too far there. But I think when a person humbles themselves and, and asks God, you know, to, to, to know, to know one way or the other, that, you know, he can reveal it to you. He's, he has all the power that there is. The entire world is going to get that opportunity. It's going to come to understand, you know, right from wrong, if their customs are good or if they're evil, if they lead to the, to the proper way or if they lead to the absolute wrong way, if they've been deceived, if they've been you know, caught up in the worship of demons generation after generation and some of the heinous stuff that goes on in the world and these cultures and you know, things that, you know, it's like, you know, talking bad about somebody's culture. Well, I'm not talking bad about their culture per se. I'm talking bad about specific practices that cause suffering and misery and bring death and disease and trouble upon the people who are doing them and upon the entire world by extension and it's just no good god is going to set all that right he's going to lay the truth out there and he is going to be merciful he is going to have mercy on all of those people and give them an opportunity at salvation like we have had and he is going to show them the truth just as he has had mercy on us and showed us the truth he's called us specifically for a special and a wonderful task uh, to bring this plan of his for all mankind to fruition and we're picturing, picturing that here on this last great day of the feast. Satan will be bound for a thousand years. Revelation 22, Roger read that yesterday. Uh, we'll have this thousand years to put this planet in the best shape it has ever been in. I'd like to read Isaiah 60. Isaiah 60, starting in verse 18. Isaiah 60, starting in 18. Violence shall no more be heard in thy land wasting nor destruction within thy borders. But thou shalt call thy walls salvation, and thy gates praise. The sun shall no more be thy light by day, neither for brightness shall the moon give light unto thee. But the Lord shall be unto thee an everlasting light, and thy God thy glory. Thy sun shall no more go down, neither shall thy moon withdraw itself. For the Lord shall be thine everlasting light, and the days of thy mourning shall be ended. Thy people shall also be all righteous. They shall inherit the land forever, the branch of my planting, the work of my hands, that I may be glorified. A little one shall become a thousand, and a small one a strong nation. I, the Lord, will hasten it in his time. In his time. At that point, it will all be prepared under Christ's leadership for the final chapter of humanity as we know it. The second resurrection, the resurrection of all mankind, the great general resurrection, for those who have never had this opportunity, have never known the truth. Uh, Revelation 25, Roger also read that yesterday. I'll quote it briefly. The rest of the dead lived not until the thousand years were finished. Here we are, last great day. God is merciful. He does not condemn the ignorant to an eternity of torture in hell. As Christ said, judge righteous judgment. And I'd like to read in John 7. Gospel of John chapter 7, starting in verse 14. Starting in verse 14, now Jesus, now pardon me, now about the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. Look there, Jesus Christ at the temple during the Feast of Tabernacles. I love that. I don't know, that's a, uh, that's a great proof in and of itself. And the Jews marveled, verse 15, saying, how knows this man letters having never learned? And Jesus answered them and said, my doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. He that speaks of himself seeks his own glory, but he that seeks his glory that sent him, the same is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. Did not Moses give you the law, and yet none of you keeps the law? Why do you go about to kill me? And that, that's because you know, he had healed on the Sabbath day. They were, they were twisted to the point that somehow this is a great crime against God to, to be merciful, to to heal, to restore on the Sabbath day, you know, to set free, as it was said. Also, verse 24 is what I, what I mentioned before we started reading this. Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. And this part up here a little that speaks, speaks of himself, seeks his own glory. That's why it's so good to stay in the Bible, to stay with Scripture, to rely on these words, because it doesn't come from us. The good doesn't come from us. We had to tumble to it sometimes in a, in a hard way 
to get here, and it's, it's him. It's these words. It's for his own purpose and his own plan that he's brought it about. Not our own glory. It's not our own wisdom. Uh, we don't have anything to boast, to boast about. But judgment is coming. And sometimes you get a little bit of it in this life. Sometimes you get time and chance. But I know that I suffered for my own faults along the way. That happens. That's part of it. Judgment is coming on the whole world. But it is not hasty. Uh, he, he says, what, Second Peter, it's Second Peter 3, 9. It says, God is long-suffering to us, word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's a good attitude to have. That's a good thing for us to remember when dealing with the world. When dealing with people who don't know the truth, God is long-suffering. He is merciful. He's been merciful to us. We need to be merciful in turn and bring, bring them along. Be a witness. Be a... Be a be a light uh, if God is calling them, and if He is not, still be merciful. Because God is maybe leaving the door open. We, we don't want to be the ones to shut it if, if God is leaving the door open for that. But this judgment, you know, it doesn't happen in an instant. I'm thankful God didn't judge me instantaneously at my worst. I'm very thankful for that. That He didn't rain down any fire or brimstone or flood the earth with water or anything like that. I mean, obviously, those are extreme examples when everything got real, real bad. But I'm, I'm sure we've all had moments where we're very happy in retrospect that lightning didn't strike right then and there. Because you would have deserved it. You didn't, you didn't earn anything different through your own thoughts and actions. You didn't earn any of that. Um, where am I here? This judgment, it doesn't happen in a moment, um, like, a, like a beauty contest or gymnastics competition. You know, there's a series of events, there's a process that you have to go through. Or, you know, if you talk about sports, you know, a, a basketball player or a great quarterback, you know, you don't decide who's the greatest or that he's a really, he was a really an excellent player after all, you know, in his rookie season. You know, it's a whole career. It's year after year after year of the ups and downs and how you bear up through those things that ends up producing the result where you can look and say, you know, yeah, he's the greatest, or he's really good, or he did a good job, he was a solid player, you know, whatever it may be, or, you know, that's the best gymnast. You know, it takes time. It takes time. God judges us over our entire lives. You know, we're thankful that he brings us to the truth, but it's not over. You, you, you persevere until the end. There are still ups and downs. There are things to be faced and, and overcome and all that. We continue growing. We try to, we try to push forward into the fullness of the truth and the, to, to smooth off the rough edges of our character as, as much as we can. Uh, not that we'll ever be worthy, but because he calls us to be a part of his perfect work and he is perfect. And we're called to be like him as much as, as much as humanly possible and beyond that because we have his Holy Spirit as well to guide us and to, to lead us. Further down in uh, John 37 and 38, in the last great day, in the last day, that great day of the feast, which we are right here, so really, on this day, on this day in history, Jesus Christ stood up and cried, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believes on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. With that, I'd like to turn to Isaiah 55. Pick up this same thought back here in Isaiah 55. As the scripture says, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Isaiah 55, verse 1. Ho, everyone that thirsts, come ye to the waters. And he that has no money, come you and buy and eat. Yea, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. And down in verse 6. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call you upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and let the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. God is merciful. He abundantly pardons. How do we drink from this rock? How do we take hold of, of these promises? How do, we, how, do we, how do we really sink our teeth into that and get the benefit from it, you know? There, there's nothing. There's, there's nothing new under the sun, is there? What did, what did Christ say? You know, you, you got the law through Moses, and let none of you keep the law. We turn to these eternal principles that God has established for all time. They're not, they're not going anywhere. They are the same principles, stated differently, presented differently, adapted to different times, but they are the same. The eternal principles of God which he's set for all time. You know, we turn to truth and to justice and to righteousness, to these words that we have. And we do so in humility, remembering our weaknesses, uh, asking pardon when we falter, and we keep following the footsteps 
of the Lord, of our King and Savior, Jesus Christ. And, and he's the greatest example that ever lived in his, his life as a testimony. It's a testimony to everything that's, that's in this book, uh, to, to the principles that the truths and the standards that God has set from Genesis to Revelation are the same. And, you know, would that God would open the eyes of the world to see that and not to try to break it into separate pieces or to do away with one part and keep the other or vice versa or ignore the whole thing entirely. Uh, these are even truths that are acknowledged some, to some extent uh, in, in the corner world, things that become self-evident over, over time and in different societies, these principles that God put in place that lead to life instead of death. To establish those, we turn to those. We follow in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. Because he did live, and through the power of the Holy Spirit, he did live perfectly. And he condemned sin in the flesh. So though we struggle, we know that that is going to be left behind. That this tabernacle is not going to last forever. But the good part, you are going to take with you. We allow ourselves to be led by his Holy Spirit, because it's God's work, right? And it's his will, and it will be accomplished. It's not us. It doesn't come for us. There's no stopping it. Uh, we just have to have faith enough, really, to to be led by it, to let him work out his plan in his own time and in his own way. Not, don't, don't get ahead of him, don't run before it. Uh, you know, don't put our own ideas on top of it, but just stick to it and let him do the work because he is going to do it. There's not gonna be any stopping it. You know, all we can do really is, is to keep our lamps burning by relying on him, by not quenching the Holy Spirit inside of us, uh, trying to be a light to this world as much as we can to help those around us to, to at least give a, give a small example of what is right and good, the way Jesus Christ gave a tremendous example, an example that shook up the entire world around him. It was a great, it was a great, great work. You know, we can't, we can't accomplish that without the Holy Spirit like he had the Holy Spirit, but if we can offer a, a, tiny, a tiny portion of it, a moment in time of justice or kindness or truth or forgiveness to anybody out there, you can do that in a small way and make a really big difference uh, so that whoever God may decide to call, whoever he wants to bring into his family at this point in time for this part that's immediately ahead of us uh, to be drawn into the truth, you know, to have the comfort in knowing that they are not alone. It's a comfort to be here with all of you because for once, you know, you're not the odd guy out. You know that you're not alone, that the truth is there, that you can fellowship with like-minded brethren. And that's why these events, these, these feasts of God are, are central things. It's rejuvenating. It's nice. it's nice to have that, to have that support, to be able to talk about what you're going through, to be able to talk about what you face in the world and how to better deal with it, to be recharged and rejuvenated and to go back out there stronger and more secure and more surely founded upon that rock. We need that. We need that regularly, and that's why God, I think, provides us these occasions regularly to, to get back together, to get back to him and focus on what is coming and what we need for this time. But to know that we are not alone like Elijah felt like he was alone and didn't want to do it anymore. And that's tragic. I'm thankful that we can do this and we don't have to go through that. Because if you were out there all by yourself, if you didn't know, uh, you couldn't communicate and get together with brethren, you might feel like you were all alone and think, what's the purpose? Why do I need to keep doing this if there is no righteousness left? This restores me. It, it reassures me that there, there are more than ten righteous in this town. That's absolutely right. And God willing, it's that way everywhere. And I hope all of God's feasts are like that to all of the people who decide to gather and, and do this same thing that we're doing. Because we're not alone. We're not alone by any means. God is with us all the way, and we have each other also. Uh, and to, to continue having that witness and the warning, you know, there's a positive, there's a negative side to the message that we have to put out there. We'll continue to go out until God's plan is finished. That's our, that's our responsibility. Uh, organizationally, that's our responsibility, certainly as, as ministers. As individuals, though, as believers, it still is the same responsibility, right? Uh, it's, it's for all of us to, to stick to the truth and to be witness to the truth. There's a scripture that says, no man, you know, putting, putting his hand to the plow and looking back is, is fit for the kingdom of God. You can't go back. I don't know about you, I can't go back. I can't do what I did before. I can't do that anymore because I, I, hand is on the plow. I mean, the only way to go is forward and through whatever may come. I'd like to close with Matthew chapter 5. Some words of Christ. Some of that truth that we can drink from Him. Some of those simple 
and reassuring things, then they're the things that the world needs the most. Needs the most. Matthew 5, verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, the humble, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. That's good news for you, Mr. Meek, right? <laughs> Verse 6. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. I, I think this is a group that does that, certainly. Wants the truth, wants righteousness. At whatever cost, you have to have that. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, or the sincere, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You know, we had, a, we had one of our feast videos taken down since we've been up here. Hmm, what does that sound like to you, right? <laughs> Verse 11. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil falsely against you. For my sake... Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets of God, which were before you. Those which were also God's servants, which also committed to sticking to the truth and speaking his words, no matter what, as I know all of you will do. This is a blessed group. I, I feel I can read these things and the promises that go along with them and feel really, really good about it even though we struggle, even though we have things that we have to overcome personally, collectively, whatever it may be, I can read this and I can feel very good about it and, and very positive because these are promises. And I can see these attributes in you. I can pray for them to be strengthened in myself and my family and those around us. Uh, we, can, we, can, we can do our very, very best to take hold of them and to live, live them without faltering without stumbling as God gives us strength through his Holy Spirit to lead us and to do that. And I feel blessed to be a part of this group, to be here, to be rejuvenated by it. Thank you all for making this a really wonderful feast. Uh, it goes by too quickly. It goes by way too fast. Uh, there isn't time. You know, I always think of all this stuff. You know, what I'd like to do when I get up there, I'd like to do this and this and this and this and this and this. And there's no time for that. There's no time for that. There's no time to get to know everybody, to spend an appropriate amount of time with them, to really get to know them, to sit and talk. And, you know, we, we get some, but we could use a whole lot more, couldn't we? We could, we, could, we could learn more from each other. We could learn more about each other, understand each other better, and therefore, you know, understand the world better, understand humanity better and what we're dealing with out there. You know, we encourage iron sharpening iron, growing in truth and strength and being rejuvenated. But our time is cut short. We're, we're tabernacling. Uh, it's temporary. Today we're tabernacling, but the kingdom of God is forever. And it's on the horizon. And I very much look forward to the day when we don't have to say goodbye anymore. Uh, thank you all for being here. Thank you, Michael. Great message today. I have a correction to make. I told Roger... When he gave me the prayer list, oh yeah, I can read your handwriting, no problem. I said, Rosie, and everybody's like, it was Ruby, my mom, so please. So, let's keep my mom in your prayers as well, please. <laughs> so now we're going to have Mr. Wayne Graves come up and give the offertory, please. Well, howdy, everybody. Has this feast flown by as far as you're concerned? Just like a blink and it's all over, right? You know, Michael was good enough to print out my sermon for me, but I have mercy on your printer. I don't want your printer to suffer damage, so I'm trying to read it from my computer. <clears throat> Some of the things that we need to think about, or that we can think about, 1 John 3 and verse 1. 1 John 3 and verse 1. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth it not, because it knew him not. <clears throat> Just picture what agape love that the Father has for each and every one of us. 
Agape love is not something that we can easily comprehend in this physical body. I think to fully comprehend it, we have to be spiritual. And eventually, we will be spiritual. I want to uh, give a little example of me giving credit to God for something that, well, let's see if you think it's good, bad, or indifferent, shall we? I wanted a camel hair jacket, this jacket. So I went to Sam's Club, and I was expecting to spend about, oh, $100 or so for a, a sport coat, a jacket. So I went, and I found it at Sam's, and I found it in my size, and it was 65 bucks. At the time, though, I usually gave, I considered that a fairly major purchase at the time, and I went home and spent 24 hours thinking about it. So I came back the next morning, and I went, and the jacket was still there. So I took it as a good sign, right? So I picked it up, went to the checkout, or started going to the checkout, and an employee, a lady, said, wait a minute, let me see that jacket. I gave her the jacket, you know, what's going on here? She marked it down to $35. <laughs> I consider this a God jacket. And he's been very good to me in so many ways. And I'm sure that he has been good to all of us in so many ways. We now have an opportunity, even the great good fortune, to be able in a small measure to give something in love to our Heavenly Father, to give something back. We have so much to be thankful for, all the great and small gifts from God. Again, my camel hair jacket is just one gift that I give him credit for. A Mr. Black said, I have found that there is a tremendous joy in giving. It is a very important part of the joy of living. And we have shown the spirit of giving while we were here. This has been an excellent feast for me. Very good. I'm proud of all of you. Proud to call you brethren, brothers and sisters. Deuteronomy 16.16, 16, we can't leave that out. Deuteronomy 16.16. 16. Three times in a year shall all your males appear before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose in the Feast of Unleavened Bread, in the Feast of Weeks, and in the Feast of Tabernacles, and they shall not appear before the Lord empty. We don't take up offerings at potlucks. We don't take up offerings at homecomings, like some fellowships do. 1 Corinthians 14.40 1 Corinthians 14.40 Let all things be done decently, and in order. One way to prepare is to think how much you want to give God, how much you've prospered during the year, and divide that up into three separate seasons or seven holy days. That's one way of doing it. However you do it is up to you and God. It's between you and God. Just give as you're able. Deuteronomy 14.22, I'm going to give you some homework, as I usually do. Deuteronomy 14.22, you can look that one up. You're supposed to tithe of the increase of all your seed. Proverbs 3 and verse 9 and 10. Proverbs 3 and verse 9 and 10. Give God your first fruits. Give Him your best. Don't give Him a crippled animal, for example, in the times of... The, the biblical times. Malachi 3 in verse 8 through 10. Malachi 3 in verse 8 through 10. This says, Will a man rob God? How were people robbing God of that, at that time? In tithes and offerings. So we ought not to rob God. You know, it says in the Bible also, all the silver and the gold are mine, saith the Lord. So, we give what we can. Proverbs 11, 24, and 25. Proverbs 11, 24, and 25. There is that scatters 
and yet increases. And there is that withholdeth more than is meet or necessary, but it tends to poverty. The liberal soul shall be made fat, and he that watereth shall be watered also himself. In Ezra 2, verses 68 and 69, Ezra 2, 68 and 69, showed the generosity of folks contributing to the work of the temple. Luke 6, 38 through 40, Luke 6, verse 38 through 40, it starts out, given it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down and shaken together and running over, shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that you give with all, it shall be measured to you again. God knows what we need. God the Father is very similar to human fathers and mothers. He's interested in his children, very interested. Sometimes in the smallest details, sometimes in the large things. Matthew 17, 27. Matthew 17, 27. Notwithstanding, lest we should offend them, go thou to the sea. This is him telling Peter to go fishing. Can you imagine that? Jesus Christ tells you to go fishing and you're a fisherman. How's that for a good thing? I love that. And cast in a hook and take up the fish that first comes up and when you have opened its mouth thou shalt find a piece of money. Take that and give unto them for me and thee for taxes. 1 Chronicles 4 verse 10. 1 Chronicles verse, chapter 4 and verse 10. I would encourage you to read this and I would encourage you to pray this prayer. And Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, O oh, that thou wouldst bless me indeed, and enlarge my coast, and that thine hand might be with me, and that thou wouldst keep me from evil, that it may not grieve me. And God granted him that which he requested. If you don't ask, you don't receive, often. This prayer of Jabez is a good prayer to pray for each and every one of us. And not just once, repeatedly. And now my computer's jumping around. Wouldn't you know it? Second Timothy 3.16, Roger quoted this one, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Luke 11, 11 through 13. I'm giving you an outline for future offertories, aren't I? If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Matthew 6, 33. Good advice for each and every one of us. Matthew 6, 33. But seek you first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you, all the good things. In conclusions, repeating, Proverbs 3 and verse 5. Repetition is the mother of memory. And as you get older, I guarantee you need more repetition than you do when you're young. Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not on thine own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. Matthew 6, verse 33. Repeating again, Matthew 6, 33. But seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. You know, I'm not, I don't have to beg for money on offertories. And I'm thankful for that. Just give to God what you can. And give to God thankfully and with a, with a happy heart. He loves a cheerful giver. Thank you all for your giving attitudes and all that you do.
Thank you, Wayne. And now we'd like to ask Miss Melody Armstrong to come up for some special music. All right. I've already been crying, so I'm just going to do my best this morning. <clears throat> Okay, now we'll have second speaker today, Mr. Chris Anderson, please. You sit back there and you, you start thinking, you know, what am I going to say? Every speaker probably goes through that and uh, I could only think of two words. Thank you, all of you. Thank you so much for being here. What a great turnout today. I have enjoyed this more than any feast that I can remember. It was something special this year and I'm so glad Wayne has always coined it. Make the next feast better than the last one and this truly was this year. Yeah, great. yeah thank you guys so much, thank you. Before I go through into uh, the sermon, I wanted to um, say thanks to my wife, her mom and dad, David and Kay, 
They are the rock of this feast site, folks. They work tirelessly, and I couldn't do it without them. All year long, what we talk about is this right here. We can't wait to get here, and we think, how can we do anything to maybe make it a little better? David provides all the audio equipment. You know, Kay works tirelessly behind the scenes with April, and like I said, I couldn't do it without them. Let's give all of them a hand. She's not here, but Mary Jane and Christina, thank you for another wonderful potluck. Thank you for organizing it. Yeah. And a special thanks to everybody who chipped in and helped, whether you brought a dish, whether you helped clean up, whether you helped prepare, or whether you brought your appetite and a smile. We were so glad you was there. Thank you. Yeah. Michael, what a great Bible study this year. We really appreciate it. Wayne and I was talking, we're going to continue that format. We really appreciate it. It was great. Great audience participation. And uh, thanks so much. You did a great job. And sitting beside him playing this wonderful piano this year. Thank you so much, Melody. That made our feast that much better. Jerry, Chris, Jim Bird, if you see this on video, Michael and Melody, thank you guys so much for the special music. We so much appreciate it, and it wouldn't have been the same without you. Thank you so much. April and Kay, and I had to put this in because I wrote this the day of the taco bar, Michael. Thanks so much for preparing all of the food. I came in and found out Michael stayed here and chopped lettuce and everything they needed. So thank you guys so much. Um, that was another wonderful hit this year. I've already had people wondering if we're going to do it again. We will in the future. I promise you, we will in the future. But thank you guys so much for your hard work because um, all of our bellies said thank you. Kay, thanks for selling the raffle tickets again. And speaking of the raffle, folks, we had a record. We had a record this year. The raffle alone brought in $1,038 this year. Great job, everybody. And when you add in the donations, we came out ahead this year with all that we spent. Thank you guys so much. Thank you so much. John Phillips is not here, but I'm sure he'll see this video. John, thanks for calling Bingo. We have no problem hearing you, brother. I share your voice. Thank you so much, buddy. We appreciate you and your wife. And to everybody who worked behind the scenes that heeded what Wayne asked you to do, and that if you see something, do it. It was just done so well. You know, any supervisor in a plant would kill for a team like you because this just worked so seamlessly this year. It was just amazing. You know, I didn't have to tell anybody to do anything. It was just done. Thank you guys so much. You have made this such a great feast. And that's why I've said all week, this whole thing is a team effort. We're all in this together. And that's what makes the Feast of Tabernacles and all of your smiling faces have made it that much brighter this year and I can't thank you enough and of course I'll say this at the end of the sermon but I can't wait to see you guys next year and please come back thank you all so much now well I can tell I wrote this before I got here because the first note is to thank everybody for being here so I think I've already done that so we're at the time when the devil has been chained eternally. Never will he deceive the nations anymore. Never will evil arise anymore. Never will there be a deception, a lie, or any other sin when we reach this day right here. The day when everybody who has ever lived and has not known the truth of God will be raised from the dead. 
whether they were Native American, whether they were Buddhist, whether they were Hindu, or whatever religion, whoever they are, regardless of the color of their sin, of the color of their sin, the color of their skin, their gender, no matter if they have hair or they're bald, I can go on, rich, poor, whether they're a pauper on the street who has no home or a king in a lavish castle, will all be raised to know who Jesus Christ is. That is a picture of a loving God. That's a picture of a God who the Bible describes as love. It's not the God that modern Christianity preaches that punishes people forever and ever and ever. No. This is a God who loves His creation, who has made this plan of salvation open to everybody. In Revelation 20, beginning at verse 7, I've got a lot of scripture for you guys today, which if you're, you're used to me, you're used to that. Revelation 20, we're going to begin at verse 7. It says, When the thousand years were ended, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations that are on the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. And they marched up a broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints, the beloved city, but fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The last rebellion ends. The devil and all who who he <clears throat> the devil who he had, had deceived them. So who? Let's put this in context with what I just said. Let's listen to this. Who? Let's put this verse in context. The devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire, and, and the English Standard says sulfur. The sulfur. The King James says brimstone. Where the beast and false prophet were and they will be tormented day and night forever. Who is tormented? Not people. The Bible plainly says Satan and his, his evil host will be tormented forever. And then we enter into this day. Verse 11, I saw a great throne and him who was seated on it from his presence the earth and sky fled away and there was no place found for them. And I saw the dead, both great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead was judged by what is written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each of one of them according to what they had done. And then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. For those who, and it's just so hard to fathom that people will still let human nature keep them out of God's kingdom. Hard to believe, but it will be. They will be turned to ash. We read about that in Malachi. They will be ash. But at this point, what have we reached? The beginning of eternity, the eighth day. Satan has been silenced forever. He and his fallen angels are kept in utter darkness in an, in an eternal prison where they will endure the punishment for their deeds. Can you imagine what it's going to look like when billions if not trillions of people are raised from the dead? Not knowing where they're at, all there to be taught with no whispering enchanter to ruin it for them. Yes, some are going to still say, I will never serve that God. Unbelievable, but some will say that. But those who will, and they will repent of these deeds that they've done, will receive God's Spirit and will inherit eternal life. And they won't receive eternal death while the others will. The greatest harvest 
season ever. I can't go through the last great day and not read Ezekiel 37. Let's turn there. Ezekiel 37 and verse 1. Quite a few verses. The hand of the Lord was upon me and He brought me out in the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley. And it was full of bones. And He led me around among them and behold there were very many on the surface of the valley and behold they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the eternal. And thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter, to enter you and you shall live. I will lay sinews upon you and cause flesh to come upon you. Verse 6 and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the eternal. So I prophesied as I was commanded and I prophesied and there was a sound and behold a rattling and the bones came together bone to its bone. And I looked and behold there was sinews on them and flesh had come upon them and skin covered them but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me prophesy to the breath Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came into them, and they lived, and stood on their feet an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these are the, are the whole house of Israel. Behold, I say, our bones are dried up, and our hope is lost. We are indeed cut off. Therefore prophesy to them, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves, raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel. And you will know that I am the Eternal, when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. And I will put my Spirit within you, and you shall live, and will place you in your own land, and you shall know that I am the eternal. I have spoken and will do it, declares the Lord. What a great day that is going to be. When the whole house of Israel, and it continues on down, when there will be no more two tribes, or two tribes, two sects, there will be no more the tribe of Israel and the tribe of Judah. It will all be one. All of this happening all because of a God who loves His creation. All because He wants everyone to come to the knowledge of salvation and that none should perish. I look forward to the day when there will be no more division, no more separation, no more racism, no greed, no hate. I look forward to the day when all will be one with God. You're a blessed bunch of people because you understand that now. All of us in here come from all walks of life. We all live a different life. But this is the one thing we share in common with each other. And it brings us together. And it unites us as family. And if I, however long I live and however long I do this, you guys will probably never hear me, not hear me say you are family. Because that is what we are and I'm gonna, that sticks with me. Because I don't look at you and just say acquaintances. I call you buddy a lot because that's my version of what Mike used to say with Bubby. But all of us here are brothers and sisters. All of us. And I believe we treat each other like that. And that's the way I love it. I love this close knit we have. And I wouldn't trade anything for it. I wouldn't. There will be a day when sin won't defile the land anymore. And there will be a day that God the Father will move His eternal throne right here. And tabernacle with us and His creation. Let's turn to Revelation 21. Beginning at verse 1, Revelation 21, 1. 
Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Why did John use that phrase? For any of us who has ever taken a wife, was she ever more beautiful than the day she walked down the aisle? I just married uh, my little cousin and her boyfriend, and I looked over at Jordan, you know, Katie was so beautiful in her dress, and I said, you will never forget how she looks right now. And uh, I choke up because I remember April. That's why he uses this language right here because he couldn't think of anything more beautiful than what he was seeing. And I heard a voice, a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write these down. For these words are trustworthy and true. And he said it to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. You guys just heard Michael read this out of the, out of, uh, the prophets. I will give from the spring of water, and well, Christ speaking also, the water of life without payment. Without payment, why? He already paid it for us, didn't he? He already paid it. He paid it for us now and for those to come during this time. The one who conquers will have this heritage and I will be his God and he will be my son. But then we get the warning, don't we? But the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for the murderers, the sexual immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. So one day, everybody will straighten up, won't they? Look what you lose if you don't. Michael read it today. If we, there's no one who looks back is fit to enter the kingdom of God because we've been called out now. When we read these scriptures, they don't mean what they do to the mainstream. They're thinking that's talking about some kind of heaven instead of a real eternal government of God, a real kingdom that never ends. We understand that. We've been called out of the chaos. We've been called out of all of this disaster that is in this world. And He's opened our minds to understand and appreciate and look forward to these Scriptures. So we can never turn back to our former lives. We can't do it. If we do, we give it all away. And that's the only way we lose it is we ourselves. No one else can take it from us. But one day, and I'm going to keep reading here in a second, we too are going to see what John saw in vision, except we're going to see it in real time. We're going to be with our King, seeing God the Father descend upon this earth to dwell not only with those with whomever, but with me and you. We will experience that for the first time too. Can you imagine it? Think about, there's that song, you know, I can only imagine. I love that song. You know, 
will I stand? Can I speak? Or will I fall to my knees? We don't know. We can't even, you know, imagine in our our thoughts about what we will feel like when we see that city coming down from heaven. Verse nine. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven oh sir, wait a minute. Yeah. Come and I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, its radiance like a most rare jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a, gr a great high wall and the twelve gates and the twelve gates and the twelve angels and the gates, the names of the twelve tribes of the Son of Israel were inscribed. On the east three gates, on the north three gates, the south three gates, and the west three gates. And the wall, the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the twelve names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And the one who spoke with me had a measuring rod of gold, said, measure the city and its gates. It says the city lies four square and its length the same as the width and he measured the city with a rod and in the English standard it says 12,000 stadia I guess is how you would say that and the length and the width are equal width and height I'm sorry and he measured its wall 144 cubits by human measurement which is also an angel's measurement think of it a wall built of jasper a city was pure gold like clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with every kind of jewel. The first jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth carnelian, and some of these I can't pronounce. I'm not even going to try. You can keep reading. But the most beautiful of stones. The twelve gates were like twelve pearls. Each of the gates made of a single pearl and the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. Don't you want to see that? If we went back, we would never see it. We would experience eternal death. That's why we keep moving forward and not look back. Because how... Can we turn our backs on inheriting that? I mean, my goodness, folks. David and I back there, we'll talk in his room. You know, I guess some people, and you know, it was a problem even in, in when Christ with his disciples, one wanted to be over the other one, you know. Oh, I'll have a greater part here and a greater there. Me and him, we'll talk, said... Whatever we do is worth it. When we get there, whatever he hands out and says, this is your reward, it's worth it. We just want to get there. I think each of us can say that, right? We want to get there. We want to enter this time. <laughs> You know, I, I, I look forward and I think of um, being with my family again. My dad was such a good man and uh, <clears throat> it'll be something to see him again. To say, let me introduce you to God's truth and with no enchanter to take it away from him. Do you realize how many people are going to convert like that? So simple. Because there's a lot of people that have good hearts in them who live what they know. And I look forward to that day. I just look forward to it. I keep leaving my notes if you're wondering. <laughs> but in verse uh, 22, that's where I got to. Verse 22. I saw no temple in the city. Why would that not need to be there? Well, it's because the temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. 
The city had no need for the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, and its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. Another way of saying there will never be war because that's the only time the city gates were shut was to keep enemies out. They will bring glory, bring into it the glory and honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. And that's where it's at. You have to have your name written there. You know, some people are so sure of it because they're doing everything in their name. You say, well, wait, well, how did you say that? Yeah, they're doing it for themselves, so many. There's been people in God's church who have left. There's been people who have been at war with God's church all and doing it in their name. And what does Christ say when they stand before Him? I did this in your name. I did this in your name. And I did this. And He says, I never knew you. Depart from me, you evil and wicked servant. That's why in the Bible study when we talked a little bit and I, I brought up self-righteousness, that's why it's so dangerous. Don't ever develop that. Don't ever say, I did this or I did this or... Always remember, we do this because we was called by the great Creator who called us out of this world and blessed us with this knowledge and blessed us, supposed to bless us with a heart like no other, to love and to cherish each other and, and those who have not yet come in. To have our names written in the book of life and not to do what is detestable or false. Let's go to chapter 22. Then the angel showed me a river, of the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. I have to stop here for a second because the place I stayed this year has a deck in it. It was overlooking the Cumberland River. I can't tell you how much time I spent out there either in my rocker or on the porch swing, looking at that river. It's soothing, it's comforting, it's beautiful. You see the fowl going, the fish jumping, it's full of life. The Cumberland's a pretty clear river. It's, it's just a beautiful, beautiful thing. And it doesn't even compare to what we're going to see on that day when this river comes. Through the middle of the street of the city, verse 2, also on either side of the river, the tree of life, with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and His servants will worship Him. They will see His face, and His name will be on their foreheads. And night will be no more. There will be no need. No, there will, they will need no lamp or sun. For the Lord God will be their light. And they will reign forever and ever. Folks, let me tell you with a surety that if you hang on, endure whatever comes at you, endure to the end, Hold tight of what God has given you and never let it go. You will reign with Him forever and ever and ever and ever. There will be no end. Eternal life, folks. Eternal life joined with our Creator. And who knows? Who knows? what all we'll get to do then. There's a whole universe out here. Who knows? But God bless you all. Hang in there. Come back next year. And my gosh, I love you and look forward to seeing you again. Thank you, Chris.
Chris. Wonderful message. And thank you for a wonderful feast, Chris. I know we all really enjoyed it. And I'd like to just give a round of applause for you and everything you've done for us this feast. This <laughs> Okay, if you'll stand, I think you know what page we're going to go to. Page number 78. Oh, yeah. I am so sorry, but thank you for the karaoke, brother. Yeah. Oh, well. Yeah. 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 Of course, yeah. Thank you all. Yeah. Had a great time. Okay, page number 78. God be with you. Page number 78, please. come before you today to give you thanks for the things that have happened in the past and ask your blessings on what's coming up in the future. We come before your throne, God, realizing that you are there on the sea of glass with Jesus Christ, our brother, and your son sitting beside you. We come before you, Father, knowing you can hear us and the 24 elders that are around about beside you and all the many millions of billions of angels that are there as well. All can hear and see what is going on be before us today. And, and to thank you, Father, 
knowing what a great God you are and your son, Jesus Christ, our brother. We thank you, Father, for this end of this day, this last great day in the Feast of Tabernacles that we have gone through. Thank you for opening our minds and our hearts to understand things that have gone on. Thank you for the messages that you have been allowed to come before us, bringing us your word. Thank you, Father, for these days that are filled with your spirit and the fact that Satan and his influences are kept out of all of your holy days. Thank you, Father, for these things that have happened for us that you have provided. We are very grateful for it. And we thank you, Father, for these things and ask your blessings upon us on our days coming up because this, this last great day does last the rest of this day until sundown. Thank you, Father, for these things and we ask you to guide us and to protect us. Set your angels about us and protect us on our ways home and, and to guide us and to bring us back here again in another year before your throne. Thank you for these things, Father. We ask these blessings and thank you in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen.